Good morning. It seems that every time I do a major political interview on the air, somebody on the other side gets really angry. Such was the case yesterday. After my interview, reasonably relaxed, I thought, with Premier Bennett. But when we got into the business of the values and profits of Cancel and the five free shares on Brick, it upset Barrett, Dave Barrett. Yesterday afternoon, he stormed into my office with this complaint. You'll see part of his complaint right now. I say that the Premier of this province did not tell the truth when he said that those profits go to service the debt. That is false. I say he did not tell the truth when he said they do not pay income tax. That is false. And I go further and I say that this company returned $80 million in modernization in one year, 1977, mostly out of profits and some new borrowings into providing jobs in this province. You'll see both segments. The Premier's statement, Barrett's angry response. And later in the program, I want to turn to something for which I make no apology. The mysterious disappearance from the seat of the Chief Justice of the Court of Appeal of British Columbia. Now satisfactorily filled, no complaints. But the other day, I had my first opportunity to question two top federal politicians. Ed Broadbent, but more importantly than that, Lang, the Minister of Justice at the time who handled most of the Farris case. Here's a smidgen of my approach. I must ask you this question on behalf of the public because there is not a single spokesman for the legal profession in the province of British Columbia who would even talk to me about it on the air. Uh, Stu Leggett did come on the air with me about it. Not one question in the House of Commons about it, was there? Uh, not one? No, I don't think there was. That's Funny, right. isn't it? Well, I think uh, a lot of people recognize the difficulty of the, of the situation. They certainly did. Among them, yours truly. We'll question Mr. Lang at some little length on the subject to see if he can give us, the public, a satisfactory explanation. Later in the program, too, we might have a chance to talk to Broadbent on political matters. A busy, active, and hopefully intriguing, provocative, and interesting morning. At least one person is mad on the program, and that's Barrett. The duty of a reporter such as myself is to report and to give responses to major allegations. Yesterday morning, I interviewed Premier Bennett at some considerable length, and we talked, of course, about the five free shares on brick. A woman from Parksville questioned the Premier on profits. His answers were interesting. But so you can understand his replies and Barrett's response, first of all, I'm going to give you the complete clip from yesterday morning's program when the woman called from Parksville to Premier Bennett. From Parksville. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Bennett. Yes, good morning. The uh, companies that go to make up this brick. Yes. What it's called. Are they, any of them making any money? Any profits? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, you've, you have assets more than companies. First of all, you've got two point, I think it's three or four million acres of exploration rights in, like in the significant Northeast for gas and oil. Uh, secondly, uh, Cancel, and I don't have this, this statement here, Cancel, which there's 81% of the shares, is, has just gone through a major modernization, and I'm not sure that uh, their, their uh, profits would Are be Are you that being great. evasive, Mr. Bennett? Well, I don't have them here, and I don't $9 million to... profit last year? Yeah, that's not... Cancel? Like, yeah, and, uh, and uh, Plateau Mills and, and Kootenai. I'm not sure about uh, Kootenai itself. I don't have... There are statements available because they're published with... Yeah, but we know Cancel made nine mil. Yeah. Right? All right. And we know that uh, Kootenai Forest Products is worth about $4 million now, yeah. don't we? Or is it Plateau? And we know that plateau there's some revenue was... coming in from the $2.4 million. They make interest. those mostly, they're servicing. Like when they make that, they, they have a debt to service, those companies. So, you know, all that doesn't well, flow out. No, Cancel yeah. has $150 million in debts for which you hold the basic guarantee, but the payments must be made out of Cancel. Sure. Is that sure. not correct? Sure. But you've guaranteed the $150 mm -hmm. million. Dollars well, not all of it, but a part of it. A part of it, yeah. $70 million, I think no. it was. No. Anything else, ma'am? Well, my, I still haven't asked my question. My main no. question is, is that if they are making any kind of a profit, uh, where that money is going now, well, where... Pay off their debts. When the shares come out. Pay off their debts. All right, then who's going to be paying off these debts? when the shares come out to the people. Oh, you'll have an asset that's a company. The, the net asset, like the appraised asset, when we, uh, when we transferred the oil and gas on these companies to BCRIC, when we uh, set up the legislation, 
uh, was $151 million. BCRIC made $9 million last year, so the appraised value then would increase to 160. The underlying value, that is, uh, that value that could be, you know, the uh, where, where it holds shares, and those shares have a trading value, uh, is about $179 million today. Uh, that's, the, that's the value that's there. Uh, the BCRIC, what you then have is a company that has those assets. I have great expectation for the oil and gas, but the money that people additionally invest, that is buying up to their, up to their 5,000 limit and what will be an attractively discounted uh, share uh, to let our people in on the ground floor, for money. the first time, will uh, that money will be that can be used by the company to go into many other businesses that can help the cash flow and the profits of the company for three, the shareholders. At least three years before there's any sign of a dividend. Well, I don't know. That's I, I'm not promising any dividend. The dividend I promise is you'll have it in your own hands. If you buy more, you'll have it there for the future. You'll participate in the growth. This company has great expectations because of the additional economic development you can it can sell undertake. It if you want to, if you can find the market. Sure. Right. Okay. Is that your question? Yeah, that's what I was mainly interested in. That answered it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. You have just seen a clip from yesterday morning's session with Premier Bennett when a woman from Parksville asked him what profits had been made by companies like Cancel, which have gone into the five free share of, of the BC Resources Investment Corporation. I got a call from Dave Barrett, who came over to town yesterday to speak at Harrison Hot Springs. And Dave Barrett was absolutely hopping mad. Now, I don't want you to take advantage of me by jumping on a program merely to respond to something that Mr. Bennett claimed, no, knowing no. what politicians no, are. No, no, no. Why are you so mad? I'm very mad, uh, or angry, Jack Webster, because of the fact that the Premier, first of all, did not answer the woman's question. And then when he was pressed by you, when you jumped in and tried to get an answer... About the profits about, of Cancel. About the profits of Cancel. He didn't have the figures with him. That's what he said. And then she said, well, it was, if it's making a profit, where did the money go? And he said, to pay the debt, to pay the debt. Well, Jack, that's absolutely false. What are the facts? I brought you a copy of the uh, 1977 annual report of Canadian Cellulose. And the truth of the matter is that, according to their own figures, profits from 1973, which were as low as 12 million point three, to 1977, 17 million. The high year was 1974 when it made $50 million in profits. It made a five-year profit of $134 million. Now, Jack? Now, he said just to, he said on that program, that this all went to paying debts, to paying debts. At no time has the debt ever exceeded $79 million. And the debt has been serviced every single year, and after all the debt and income tax, which is also paid, they've made a total of $134 million profit. I got the impression that because these were kind of crown operations, there was no income tax payable by them. He is absolutely false here, too, and he made that claim. Why is that, though? Because a crown corporation doesn't pay income tax. You have to own 90%. In this instance, there are still private shareholders, and we did not buy them out, much to the uh, dis uh, dismay of some and satisfaction of others because we did not nationalize we made a purchase only a little over 80 percent of this company is owned so by you the are sitting here now Dave Barrett contradicting or supplying information the premier did not give to me I say that the premier of this province did not tell the truth when he said that those profits go to service the debt that is false I say he did not tell the truth when he said they do not pay income tax that is false and I go further and I say that this company returned $80 million in modernization in one year, 1977, mostly out of profits and some new borrowings into providing jobs in this province. Now, if he's going to say these things, then he'd better be honest about what he's saying because there are laws about issuing a false prospectus. 12.3 million net earnings after income tax paid in 73. That is correct. Adding up 50.9 in 74, 27.5 in 75, 26.1 in 76, 17.3 in 77 for a total of $134 million. That is correct. $134 million profit. Well, were you aware of the fact that $80 million largely from profits was used to modernize Yes, I said on Channel 8 yesterday in the interview that $80 million had gone back in in one year. And where is that money going to come from? It means increased taxes because that kind of money has to go back in to modernize and update. All of that $80 million in one year wasn't entirely profit. It was some accumulated profit plus a new borrowing. But even at that, 
The highest total borrowings at any time by this company has been $79 million. That's all. The point, basically, you're making, you're accusing the Premier of being evasive to me. For well, I'm going further. I'm telling you the Premier was not telling the truth, and I'm fed up with it. I found him doing this time and time again, making allusions about the personalities of some of our MLAs and false statements about some of the businesses we bought, and I'm a little fed up with it. Jack. In addition, you're making the point, surely are you not, that this asset, which has been put into the five free share corporation, is a wealthy money-making asset whose the revenues would have gone to general revenue one when, way or another. When we bought that asset, their shares were worth 19 cents per share. Five years later, they're worth $9.71 a share. The people of British Columbia have benefited to the tune of $134 million, plus the jobs, plus the security, plus the regional economic development. Jack, that's a proud record. His own corporation is boasting about it. He should at least tell the truth. You've seen the clip and you've seen the response. Perhaps the point could be, oh, I've alerted the Premier's office to watch that this morning. And of course, a tape will be available or a transcript will be available if the Premier wishes to reply to Mr. Barrett. It's not my position to engage in running fights day after day after day, but this is a serious charge made by Mr. Barrett. And I'm sure that Mr. Bennett, one way or another, will want to respond to it. What happens next? I don't know. I, the one little lighter-hearted thought I have, if one can have a lighter-hearted thought on these particular occasions, is that it certainly is a, an encouragement for those recipients of five free shares that can sell over that five-year period. Net earnings after the payment of income tax, after the payment of income tax, were over the five-year period to 1978, 134 million dollars. Next we are going to deal, and as I said no apologies for it, with the views of two of the top politicians in this country, Brad Bent of the NDP, a man of considerable suavity, sophistication and understanding, a political scientist, a man who hopes to set the finest moral standards of, of um, public servants, I'm not speaking about him himself, but the kind of uh, attitude we all want to see in Canada, similarly with Otto Lang, former Minister of Justice, former Dean of Law, very influential cabinet minister in the Liberal government for many years, the man who in fact handled the whole affair of the disappearance from public life of the former Chief Justice of the Court of Appeal of British Columbia. And I'm going to delve into that in some detail with successive interviews, first with Broadbent and then with Lang after this break. I do not need, nor do I wish, to rehash the sad, tragic, and unhappy circumstances which saw the man, the distinguished lawyer, who occupied the position of Chief Justice of the Court of Appeal of British Columbia, vanish quickly and without any proper explanation from his top position as the top judge in British Columbia. I've raised it on a number of occasions. I've expressed myself editorial very strongly. There is no way that I can interview Broadbent, leader of the NDP, the man who is responsible for questioning in the House of Commons for his entire opposition party without attempting to get his views on what I regard as the unsatisfactory handling of the Farris affair. Why was not one single question raised on the floor of the House of Commons by your people, the people with a social conscience, over the mysterious disappearance from the top judicial position in British Columbia, one of the top 11 in the country, of a former Chief Justice of the Court of Appeal, John Farris? Well, my attitude on that, uh, when I read the news story, for him would be precisely the same as most people in their private capacities. If they resign, even if they're public personalities, and as a judge obviously is, if they resign, I assume he's doing so either for some kind of perceived, perhaps, indiscretion on his part, and perhaps no more than that, um, or uh, there was the possibility allegations were made of perhaps criminal wrongdoing. These were all rumors. And uh, my assumption is that uh, 
if he's resigned and there is criminal wrongdoing, we have police forces in Canada. We have a good police force in British Columbia that charges would be laid. And uh, I am the last to want to publicly cast aspersions on, on any individual. I don't care what position he has, uh, simply on the, ground, on the basis of innuendo. So charges were not laid. He resigned. As far as I'm concerned, that's a private matter. Well, the matter's finished and done with. Yes. The top judge in British Columbia can walk away in the face of a simple allegation, neither proven nor disproven, go to England and after his leave of absence, and the public is not supposed to ask what is behind this, not supposed yeah, to ask oh, the why not a public inquiry <laughs> of some kind. And the public can ask all kinds of questions. If Jack Webster decides to resign out of the blue from his television responsibility. Oh, come no, off it, come off it, Mr. Broadbent. Come off it, that's Mr. Person, Broadbent. Uh, not, not come off it at all. That's, that man has a private life as, as sacrosanct as yours or mine. If he's not involved in criminal wrongdoing, if he's not involved in some violation of the law, what right have I, especially, I would add, in the House of Commons to slander, because I have immunity, I can say anything in the House of Commons, as you well know, to slander an individual. If there is evidence for criminal wrongdoing, then, then that individual, and I don't want to suggest there is, but if there were, then the police have an obligation to bring it to the court. You, sir, as a member of the opposition, of total faith in the politicians who control the administration of justice, that they will make sure everything is done without ever being prompted by you when you have privilege on the floor of the House of Commons? If I had evidence brought to me that there was criminal wrongdoing, you can be sure within 24 hours I would have acted upon it. No such evidence was ever brought. Just the wildest slanderous stories that I've heard, in fact, about most people at different times. I could Mr. say all the senior Broadbent. politicians Mr. I Broadbent. know I've heard slanderous stories. And Mr. I'm not Broadbent. going to get up and raise objections. Mr. Broadbent, I'm saying to you that when the top judge in a province in British Columbia, faced with a simple accusation, merely says, my impunity has been attacked, my integrity is impugned, I'm going to walk away from it, is that a precedent for any other judge similarly so attacked? to submit his resignation and walk away without public knowledge or public inquiry of the facts behind it? Do you, you know what the simple answer to all that is? I'd love yes. to hear it. The simple answer is yes. And if there's any evidence that there's any wrongdoing, then we have a legal system, charges should be laid against that man just like anyone else. How do we know that there has been any kind of investigation at all, Mr. Broadbent? Well, I mean, I say Jack Webster beats his wife. You know, I hear, I'm serious about this. Jack now, Webster. I hear, I hear. I hear. Jack Webster is resigning. Is running the program. And someone comes up to me in the in the lobby of the Georgia Hotel and says, "Do you know why Jack Webster did it? Because he beats his wife." And someone was going to leak that to the press. And 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 I, am I going well, to let say, me put "Oh, it well, I want an investigation into that." Let, Not at all. What is your Not private profession again? My private profession. Oh. Your I'm, trade? I'm, now, I must admit, I've been a university been professor. A yes, and I've been a political other, scientist. And many other faults. Let as me well. give you some simple questions. Yes. They have to be. If I'm an academic, they have to be very simple now. You are appointed as a political move to a top privileged position, normally free from criticism, normally free from any attack, tenured for life within most limits, cannot be removed except by a joint address of the House of Commons and the Senate. And on the face of a simple inquiry, you mysteriously walk away. No, well, Must we accept that blanket assurance that there's nothing no, wrong? No, no, no. Let me, let me go one step further. And the basic principle I will stick by, that you don't just slander people. When it came up... Are you suggesting story, I've you... slandered anybody? Oh, no. Jack, no. Would I, would I turn that argument around in an unfair way that you might know? Well, I wouldn't do that. I am saying that when the story broke, it was discussed, for example, in our executive meeting of our caucus, Stuart Leggett, who is a member of Parliament for I informed Mr. Leggett of uh, many of the well, Mr. Leggett, matters of which he did Mr. not Leggett, know. Mr. Leggett, who is a very conscientious member of Parliament and very able, we discussed it in the executive. We were interested. When a man so you should have been. resigns. And the question was raised, is there any evidence that you know of of criminal wrongdoing? And the, and the answer by Mr. Leggett was no, in fairness. And, and he, along with the rest of us, said, well, how can you conceivably, therefore, slander a man or a woman if you don't have evidence. I must make a correction right now. There is no suggestion by anyone of criminal wrongdoing. What we are saying is that the public should have been given the fullest explanation of the circumstances because an innocent man may well have been crucified, but nothing was done by to himself? Clarify. 
Yes. Well, if he, then he is the man that should demand the, the investigation. If they said it if about... If you resign, if you resign or anyone else in this country resigns from his or her occupation... No, no. Have special is, office. No, special office or not. And, and goes out, then it is his responsibility or her responsibility to demand an investigation. If... If I, not, it's if, a tantamount to a plea of guilty. No, it is not. It, it's tantamount to saying what, it, for whatever reason, it might have... I'm not going to speculate on all the kinds of things it might have been. That person's decided to get out. It's not my reason to go into his or her personal life unless there are good, objective reasons to believe. In this case, there was criminal wrongdoing. I'm not going to slander people. There was... Who's suggesting criminal wrongdoing? Well, why, why demand an investigation? To know what happens when judges walk away from the top offices without any explanations from the people who appointed them. That, Jack, I suspect is going to be your view, and I have mine, and we're going to differ. We most certainly do. And I think the kindest thing I can say about that interview with Mr. Broadbent is that it demonstrates the lack of interest shown in serious matters in Western Canada by the caucus of the NDP, as well as the caucus of the Liberals and the caucus of the Tories. I should have reminded Mr. Broadbent that when Mr. Leggett was on this program, he finally conceded that my arguments were in the main valid and that at the very least they should have been a full public explanation of the situation. I don't know if I'm, I'm certainly not reaching for straws. I'm certainly not trying to hound, chase, or harass anyone. And I try again, in a moment or two, to impress the gravity of the situation on the former Minister of Justice, Mr. Otto Lang. Mark Lalonde, the new Minister of Justice, is in Vancouver today at a federal provincial constitutional conference. He will not be interviewed. I don't want to talk to him about constitutional affairs. I want to talk to him about the judge's affair. Why Mr. Lalonde doesn't want to talk on this, I do not know. It was not, however, second best to talk only to Otto Lang, because Otto Lang was the man who handled the f affair from the first information from the Commissioner of the RCMP directly to the Minister of Justice, not, you'll remember, to the Attorney General of British Columbia, who also won't talk to me on the issue or make any statements to anybody else on the issue. So let's go to Otto Lang, recent Minister of Justice. You had to handle one of the unhappiest episodes in Canadian judicial history, did you not? Yes, I did. Do you think you handled it properly? Yes, I think I did. Why has there been, I must ask you this question on behalf of the public, because there is not a single spokesman for the legal profession in the province of British Columbia who would even talk to me about it on the air. Uh, Stu Laggett did come on the air with me about it. Not one question in the House of Commons about it, was there? Uh, not one. No, I don't think there was. That's Funny, right. isn't it? Well, I think uh, a lot of people recognize the difficulty of the, of the situation, and... Uh, respected it. I mean, you said it was difficult, and it was in many ways, and uh, th that was uh, probably what motivated them. Well, I'll tell you what bothers me, and I'm old enough to say this, Mr. Lang. A top judge in this country, in the face of a simple, unproven allegation, walks away without any, and no proper explanation is given by people like yourself, or people like Lalonde, as to whether the man did anything wrong or did not do anything wrong, as to whether there was a proper investigation, if not by the Minister of Justice, by the Attorney General of British Columbia. And the fact is that even today, with your excellent new appointments, the whole system of justice is in British Columbia is left under a very dark, murky cloud. Would you not concede that my interpretation is reasonable? Yes, I suppose uh, cloud there is. I, I, I suppose you wouldn't find it wrong if I said maybe the uh, 
introduction of the subject and a treatment of it, even by yourself, may have helped uh, with the creation of the cloud. No, than, sir. Deny that case, uh, In any case, I, I, I think that we did what we could in the way of information. Um, I mean, the man may have been totally innocent of anything. The point is that uh, one has to, in a position of an attorney general, be extremely careful with uh, references to uh, accusations and, and suggested evidence. Uh, normally, uh, one uh, simply does not refer to any thing at that stage of any kind of case. And uh, uh, obviously, for instance, if uh, an investigation is going on, an attorney general does not comment on it. Uh, the result is not comment, even when he's satisfied the investigation leads to something further. Well, it's charges. It's a chance to the of the person against whom the allegations are to defend. I don't so want on. to be paranoid about this, Mr. Lang, but I just want to put a couple of things to you. We now have, and you're a lawyer, a dean of law, right? I Former once, dean of law? I once was, yes. Yeah. We now have a situation whereby, and I'm ex putting this very extravagantly, if we have ten more allegations by irresponsible people made in public as to the conduct of ten judges, we can expect these ten judges to say, my integrity has been impugned, my usefulness is impaired, I'm going to quit and go on leave of absence. Is that not correct? Well, I don't think I'm going to try to project uh, into any you know other I'm trying alternative to, I'm, case. No, I'm just saying that we now have a legal precedent where a judge is challenged, he walks away and that's all the public hears. Well, certainly that's all they're going to hear from me. But, uh, is that proper, though? Well, I don't think there's anything more to be said. And that's it. So, therefore, the ordinary people who don't have access to the fullest information must just have full faith in their elected officials and in the Canadian Judicial Council and just leave it at that. Well, you're distorting the situation somewhat because uh, in terms of any uh, public responsibility of uh, Attorney General, uh, provincial or federal, uh, the matter uh, would be, of course, very different if uh, we were talking about a uh, judge in office. Um, or if we were talking about anything that had anything to do with um, charges which could be laid, uh, obviously the due process would have to be followed in, in all such cases. Um, the uh, fact of the matter is that uh, uh, not being in office anymore, uh, the uh, public uh, concern in a non-criminal matter uh, no longer leaves any place for it. There isn't any doubt, function. however, though, that the standards required of a judge with tenure and security and freedom normally from criticism must be much higher than that of the ordinary citizen. Oh, there's no doubt at all about that. As that should now be clear to everyone involved. I think that's clear. The matter is buried. The legal profession, which has refused to face up to the implications the responsibilities, the understanding, the assistance to help the public in understanding have won their battle. The affair is now dead and gone. I am not about to become paranoid about it. I am not about to continue this particular fight. I have done my best to demonstrate to you that the most important thing in a democracy, without a shadow of doubt, Next to the behavior of a massive majority in the House of Commons is the administration of justice. And the administration of justice in British Columbia has on this occasion and on lesser occasions in lesser courts to wit the provincial bench been left under a cloud which allows the man in the street, and this is the grave danger, to look at judges and say, it doesn't matter what you do, it's who you are. And I say that with regret, but with sincerity, that with all the paragons of virtue, we have leading and speaking for justice and decency and democracy and freedom and civil liberties, and hounding the RCMP in some ways justifiably, in some ways not, in the McDonald Commission, and expect big developments of inquiries into the RCMP in at least one major occasion here now, in front of a Royal Commission, you'll find policemen, when they get involved in bad things, of whatever they may be, they're up on the spotlight. And we are left here, and this is my final statement on the whole affair, with the unsatisfactory conclusion of a very black mark 
only otherwise within my time good record of the superior courts in the province of British Columbia. Sound like I'm preaching and I am preaching. I was bitterly disappointed with Broadbent's attitude to this this morning, largely because of his lack of knowledge, lack of proper inquiry into the affair, lack even of one question in the House of Commons. Can the Minister of Justice please give the public assurances on the floor of the House of Commons, which in itself would have been much better than an indelicate press release, as I recall some of the details, released by Mark Lalonde, who had been in office five minutes and who obviously didn't write the press release himself. God knows who wrote it. That was all we got. One press release out of Ottawa. We've got old head in the sand, guard them in Victoria, who has been totally unsatisfactory in the matter. Had he come forward straightly and given us personal assurances and faced the questions from the public, we might well have dropped this thing long ago. Had we faith in Gardam's uh, handling of the, the lower level judicial council in the judges, the other judges, CAPA, we might have looked at it with some confidence and some understanding. But when you add the two performances together, provincial and federal, I shudder for any further incidents affecting the administration of justice in British Columbia. File closed, case over, buried. The establishment wins hands down all the way. Take a break. I do ask viewers to forgive me this morning. I just had to light up a cigarette so I could, as an addict, admit that uh, I was getting a little tense. So I'll just take one puff. Horrible habit. Down to the soles of my boots. And I won't do it again. I just wanted to break my own tension there just now, and your tension too. I don't want to talk about the judge's affair. No, Linda, I don't want to talk about the judge's affair. I want to go for a free-for-all, because I suspect the response, said he immodestly, will largely be favorable. I've buried it. I'm buried it, too. I'm going to join the establishment. Who am I to challenge the most powerful people in the land? Name of goodness. Certainly not. I want some light-hearted calls. I wouldn't mind if somebody told me a joke, anything at all, except just to mention them. <laughs> you know? When I went, sat down the other day with, uh, I'd been out doing some work uh, with a film crew on um, a story I'm going to give you in some detail. I meant to give you a promo on about it today. <laughs> and it's a most unhappy story. And it's to do once again with the administration of justice. It's not a funny story. It's about a woman who was slaughtered on a road in Delta by a carload of young people who had been at a pretty good drinking party and who thought they had hit a garbage can. There was flesh all over the headlights, mind you, and she'd be not 58 feet in the air, but they thought they'd hit a garbage can. It was a poor woman who died almost instantly. And uh, there was an inquest. Do you know how long it took the inquest to take place? From December the 31st, 1977 until September, the middle of September, 1978. What happened? Any charges? Not a one. Any points lost by the driver? Not a single solitary one. And I am in the middle right now and I've finished all my filming, and I've just to put it together in one piece. This, to me, another shocking story. There are legal explanations, of course, which you shall see in spades, in full. But on that occasion, I'm really grateful to one of the Crown Council, who cooperated with me to the nth degree to give his side of the story. See, as a reporter, you can't get away from the administration of justice. One of the great scandals 
No, wrong word, scandal. One of the great deficiencies of all, of the printed press particularly, because you can't really expect radio or television to do a good job on the coverage of the courts. But the most important things in our society, believe me or believe me not, happen in the police courts and in the civil and superior courts. And the coverage we get when we have newspapers is minuscule. This is where the socially significant things happen. This is where you can keep an eye on judges, keep an eye on the administration of justice, keep an eye on people's civil liberties. But we don't cover it. We, the media, and I'm to blame too. Many years ago, I made a bit of a name for myself covering a celebrated inquiry into graft corruption, mismanagement, and laxity in Vancouver City Police Force. And there was a hungry audience for the details of these particular problems. But what I suppose distresses me most of all about the Farris case is one, the lawyers went underground. Boy, did they hide. And the fact that you talk to, I mean, Lang knows his facts. And I wasn't about to sit and nag him on all the little nitty details. I just wanted to get his attitude. But Broadbent really upset me. Broadbent obviously knew nothing about the case. I wouldn't say he couldn't care less, but he was not well advised on what had happened in that affair. Will it be raised in the provincial house? Will anyone care to question the Attorney General of British Columbia as to his role in the matter? I can think of a couple of little points. Did the RCMP go directly to Ottawa and not go to the Attorney General of BC? And if not, why not? Maybe they went simultaneously. We don't know. And as I say, let's drop it. Let's forget it. We've lost the battle. Maybe people have learned their lessons. Maybe they may have learned them out here, but I don't think they've learned them in Ottawa. They know that the MPs from British Columbia, if it happened here again, won't ask any questions. Because none of them did. Not Simmer Holt. Not Stu Leggett. Not Ron Huntington. I'm trying to think of the ones that you might call outstanding. Names escape me. Maybe there aren't any. <laughs> Certainly not. Ray Perot didn't raise it in the Senate. Anyway, what am I trying to do? How long till the next break? Phone calls a mixed bag. Bennett, Barris, and Farris. That's the message I got from behind the camera. What do you say? Now, look, Linda, I don't want to go to the Farris case. Is that clear? I'm censoring the Farris case. I have been, I am not under any command, but I think it's time I shut my mouth. I've, I've said my piece. Uh, people who agree with me may agree with me. People who don't agree with me may disagree with me. And that's all there is to it. No more, there isn't any more. Now we'll go to a break and come back with who knows what. Camera on Linda, why? <laughs> why is it a camera on Linda? You're on camera, Linda. Smile, you're on candid camera. I'm sorry about that cigarette, Linda. Oh, you're, you're not mic'd, are you? No mic, just nod your head. Okay, telephone calls, not on the Farris case. Long distance from where? Okay, I'll do as I'm told, Linda, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Jack. Morning. Uh, big bouquet for your show, I think you're doing province of British Columbia, a great job. Thank you. Um, you had mentioned last week about uh, arranging or trying to arrange a debate between Barrett and Bennett, and you haven't made any mention in the last few days having them on the show. As a matter of fact, if you'd been half smart and half awake, which I wasn't, you'd have phoned me up and said, why don't you well, I talk to Bennett about it? I, it totally escaped my mind. I thought about it, but I... <laughs> I wish you had, because, you know, it's very important to Barrett to have the debate. It's not important to Bennett to have the debate, but the least I can do is ask. Yeah, I, I, I promise I will. I promise I will. Very good. Thanks, Jack. Thank you very much. Victoria. 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 That's for lip readers. I used to be able to do, you know, I used to play soccer with uh, mute youngsters. You're not allowed to say deaf and dumb, you know, Fred. And uh, you're not. A-E-I-O-U. Victoria was... I have a suspicion. 
bordering on certainty that although you may not be deaf, I think you may be quite dumb. I'm calling it, uh, I'm calling with reference. Will you start again, please, sir? Are you unable to hear me? I can hear you now. I wasn't listening. I was not paying attention. Oh, fine. Well, I am not paying attention. That's typical of you. Yes, sir. Time, isn't it? Yes, sir. I'm calling, uh, because of your great wind and length about your discussion with uh, Mr. Bennett yesterday. Yes, sir. Uh, the lady that called from Parksville had given Mr. Bennett the opportunity to hang himself on TV yes. uh, with her question that you barely allowed her to get out in the first place, and then Mr. Mr. Bennett started doing his mental tap dance, and you so astutely noticed that he, he was being evasive, and I suspect I have a suspicion bordering on certainty that he was being evasive for one of two reasons. One, he didn't have the answers to the question that you barely allowed to get in. Or two, he had the answers, but he, but he didn't want to let the public at large know what the hell these answers were. Now, this is, this is one thing that aggravates me about you. Look, am I not to be complimented for, from your point of view for putting Barrett on with the full answers? To get their point across. Am I not to be complimented for at least doing my reporter's job? A reporter is supposed to report, not spout off. On in the ear jam. Did he hang up? I hear the message from the telephone company. Nobody there. <laughs> Where am I? I'm there. I'm following the cameras this morning, Henry. You might as well realize it. Go ahead, please. Mr. Webster. Yes, sir. Two weeks ago, you promised us that we would have a program with something on the lighter side in it. <laughs> yeah. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay. Now, let's go into this CPI takeover of British Columbia. The lighter side. Right. Now, listen to this. This is straight from the crystal ball. When Mr. Bennett Sr., the great ventriloquist up in Kelowna, told his son that the province of British Columbia was not for sale, I'm afraid Bennett Jr. got it wrong. BC is for sale to CPI, CP Investments. Now, here's the point. They buy the province, correct? Yeah. Now we've got to have some ministers. Right. As Minister of Finance, uh, Mr. Van Der Zand, who likes to gather in the shekels, will be in charge. He'll have a board of three used car dealers currently available in Victoria and the government to rake in the shekels. Shekels, rather. Now, we're extremely rich. And uh, that is good, not at all. Now we're a threat to Alberta as the richest province. So we have to have a minister of overspending to counterbalance this. And here's where we call in Mr. Marv Levy. Mr. Who? Mr. Marv Levy. Minister oh, of no, Overspending. Levy, he, minister of overspending. Yeah. Yes. Shovel on the back of the truck. Now this puts us in the red, and that's bad, eh? That's bad. Not at all. Now what we have to do is to overnight transfer British Columbia's ownership from CP Investments to Canadian Pacific Railway. Now that is bad? Not at all. We immediately qualify for subsidies from Ottawa. Right? Right. Now then, we're solvent, we always will be, and every man, woman, and child in this province can live like a king. Or a queen, since we have some of those around. Queen? How's that? Have we ever? How's that for the crystal ball? Laugh. It's excellent. There's only one complaint I have. What's that? Which would you rather have at Van der Zam's right hand? Three used car dealers or three social workers? <laughs> Take your pick, but I'll go for help up for the car dealers. Much obliged. He tried to be funny anyway. Give him credit. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Webster. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit on uh, the Canadian ownership of Canada and the way people are purchasing up the country. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a piece of paper here that it, uh, mentions a little bit on the amount that we are losing, considering we just lost um, a little bit from the Bennett regime or whatever it is. It's uh, got to do with the foreign control companies without invitation to Canadian controlled firms. The impact of this reliance on non-Canadian design procurement... You're reading something. That's right. What are you reading from? Well, it's a private report documented by a particular company, which I'm not at liberty to... Oh, you're not very interesting. You better come to the point. But getting down to percentages, it does mention that uh, 
transfer to other countries and, the, and limit the growth of Canadian firms. It is estimated that 500 million of business services, of which 200 million are for engineering designs, are imported annually. Good point. Yeah, this represents about 20,000 lost jobs. Good point. And further, worse than that even is the research and development done by the American multinationals. That's right. For use up here is all done in the United States. Most of the big forest firms, as I recall a few years back, closed their R&D departments. That's right. Cheaper well, that's, to do it in the States. This, so this purchasing has been increasing at an average annual rate of between 15 to 20 percent over the last 10 years. And of course, if it keeps up, we, know, we all know where that's going. Well, we know where it's going anyway. I don't know what the answer is. But thank you, sir, for a serious call. Yes, yes. Hello. Hello. Nobody there. Okay. Go ahead, please. Oh, hello. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm just going to comment again. Shame on you for yesterday. I felt that uh, you were being a pussycat with our premier, and I had two reasons, but one has already been discussed, so I'll go right on. I, he was spouting off yesterday about free enterprise and how he believes in it. I don't really believe he believes in free enterprise as much as he believes in private enterprise. Meow. Can I say that? Meow. With my five shares, I have no voice. And after paying my car insurance at the end of February, I'm going to have to dig up... Can't please you NDPers no matter what you do. That was a reasonably good interview with Bennett yesterday, and Barrett was on this morning shouting his head off with some justification and you phone me up and you nag me I just don't understand you I never will just keep watching go ahead please morning mr. Wester uh-huh um, we had a call last night at about 8 30 from statistics Canada oh yes and they uh, wanted to know eight o'clock last night they called you at 8 30 and they were making a survey to help the police departments in British Columbia and they wanted to know um, how many people in our house over 16 years of age. Why were they phone at 8 o'clock at night? Well, 8.30. Did they, give, did they give you a number? Uh, yes. He said, if you'd like to check, uh, our number is 666-3551. Uh, what was the name of the person? Uh, Dolores. Dolores. Yeah. Are you sure it was Stats Canada? Uh, yeah, I phoned back. Oh, you phoned back, 666-3551. And what kind of survey were they doing? Uh, they were doing a survey uh, to help the police in crime prevention. And um, uh, they wanted to know the number of people over 16 years of age in each household. And but I told them I wasn't prepared to... Did they want to know if they were home or out breaking into stores? They wanted to know how many people were in the house that age. And that's all they wanted to know? Yeah. And it's legit? Legit. So Don't I they get that from the census figures? Uh, Do you live in Vancouver? Yes. And I'm in the area where 42% of the crime is. Oh, I'd like to know about that survey, wouldn't you? Yeah. So I phoned it, the police department right afterwards. Okay, good for you. And I got a hold of the top uh, deputy down there. At 8 o'clock at night? Yeah. That was unusual. And I told him uh, about what had occurred, and he said he didn't know anything about it, but he'd leave a message for his... Uh, and what, was your, what did you finally believe? Was it a phony call or a real call? Well, I phoned back to uh, Staff Canada, or Statistics Canada, and I uh, got another girl on, and she said, oh, you didn't phone the police department. And I said, I sure did. I said, I got all, all sorts of phony calls. Oh, she said, well, that is quite legit, but she says, I guess we're in trouble now. I'll phone them and find out. I'm much obliged for your call. All right, sir. Which exchange do you live in? Uh, Bay Barton. Which exchange do you live in? 876. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Suzanne, phone and find out if there's anything to that. 666-3551. I haven't done much in the way of phones this week. No harm in doing a bit more. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Good morning, madam. Uh, I would like something clarified, whether I heard you wrong or not. About a week and a half or so ago, you mentioned, uh, well, Alberta Energy, uh, what the Albertans did. They gave the preference to Albertans to buy at $10 a share, and what happened, it skyrocketed. It was either called Alberta Resources or Alberta Energy Corporation. It was restricted to Albertans. I think it went out at a fairly modest price and went up sky high. No. 
Uh, Alberta Energy, uh, it was started at $10 for Albertans alone. For which? Uh, for Albertans alone. Correct, uh-huh. Then what was left over was available to all Canadians at $10 a share, the same price as Albertans. I bought a 1000 I know. You bought a 1000 They never did skyrocket, Mr. What West. did they go to? What uh, skyrocketed was Alberta Trunk, which was sold to Albertans only 24 years ago. Not the Alberta Energy, Alberta Trunk, which is a different company altogether. Alberta Trunk is a private corporation. Pardon? A private corporation. Alberta Trunk, not Alberta Energy. There. All right, what, what did you pay for Alberta Energy? $10 a share. What's it at now? And they went down to eight and a half, and they are now about 15 and a half. And you bought 10000 The highest they ever went to was about $19. And they didn't stay there very long. They've been dropping since. Alberta Trunk went up to $75, and then they gave a split five to one. Right? You're right. That's a different company than Alberta Energy altogether. Well, I didn't that Alberta Trunk was sold to Albertans alone 24 years ago. 24 years ago. Ma'am, thank you for setting the record straight. I wish I'd bought some Alberta Trunk. Yeah. Did you? Four years ago. Did you buy any? Uh, I was too young then. <laughs> what do you mean too young? Four years ago. Four years ago? 24 years ago. Alberta Trunk. Good get. to Albertans only. And it's a government corporation. Yep. Much obliged, my dear. And Bye. Not only, I'd like another question. Uh, I have shares in Columbia Cellulose. I've had them since 1962. Now then, after a while, I paid 750 for the shares. But after a while, uh, there was a strike, and the mill shut down. Now, of course, we all know they're doing well because of our devaluated dollar, right? But if our dollar should come up, and if there should be a strike, uh, they won't be worth anything again, right? Don't ask me to predict stocks. Uh, I'm the world's worst uh, investor. When was their last strike agreement settled? IWA had no agreement this year. It's next year. Next year? Yeah. If they should go on strike and close down, there goes your shares, eh? Unless you want to... Well, I don't know. Market Blow hasn't done too bad, apart from its drop from 28 to 23 after Bennett stepped in. Pardon? But I remember when Mac and Blow were at $10, and I remember, remember when they were at $33. Yeah. They're at 23 just now. They went up to 28 when Big Julie made his bid. Yeah. Dear old Big Julie. I'd love to know what happened between yeah, Bennett uh, and Big Ian Julie. Ian Sinclair. Ian Sinclair. Yeah. Great guy. He's with the Brothman in Industry, isn't he? Uh, no. Dynasty now, is he? He's is not. He's not? He's the chairman of the board of Canadian Pacific Railway. Oh. And they are not owned by the Brompton. Which, uh, the establishment has a finger in it too, isn't it? I would say yes. It's somewhat of an establishment firm, the Canadian Pacific Railroad. Yeah. Somewhat of an establishment firm. Yeah. But uh, anyway, um, I uh, just wanted to... You know you've it. cleared the record for me. I'm much obliged. You'll go on forever. Port Albany. Hello, Mr. Webster. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, in, during the last few weeks, uh, we've been hearing nothing but verbal battles between the two uh, headmen of BC. Part I think of uh, the, your program should change to a more lighter side, especially this today. It was really morbid this morning. I listen to you uh, as often as I can. Well, I'm trying to brighten it up just now. What do you think I'm doing this for? Pardon? What's that? I'll try and brighten it up. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I got a suggestion for you. Please. How about uh, bringing uh, our famous uh, uh, Sasquatch hunter back on? You haven't, you didn't is have that Rennie, him for a long time. Is that Rennie de Hinden speaking? No, no. no you no, sound I'm, like uh, Rennie de Hinden. Yeah, but uh, Rennie de Hinden would be a good man to have on, uh, brighten up the... Rennie de Hinden's accent is thicker than yours. That's quite right, that's quite right. And then, of course, the other Sasquatch hunter is now a politician. Could be, could John be. Green. Yes. Listen, I was one of the original Sasquatch reporters. Where are you? I interviewed the woman, or the man who saw the woman being... The man who saw the Sasquatch crossing the road at Flood, B.C., mm -hmm. about 1954. Right. 
And I believe in Sasquatches. I do too. I think they're running the country. Gotta go. <laughs> That's a joke, by the way. It really is a joke, no matter who is watching. <laughs> Webster. Suzanne, pick up 351, will you? 351, tell me when they're ready. I decided to show you my lighter side. In other words, I'm going to sit this way and hold in my tummy. <laughs> That's the lighter side of Webster this morning. Are we there? Yes, I'm here. Ah, madame, uh, are you one of these Stats Canada people? Yes, I am. You are not a computer. I'm sorry? You're not a computer. I'm not a computer, Mr. Webster, no. My dear, I'd be very grateful if you could just fill in... Uh, What's happening about these phone calls you're making at night from strange women to people in this area? Okay, could you just hold, please, Mr. Webster? Thank what? you. You won't tell me. She's got a supervisor. Pick it up, uh, somebody. Linda, would you pick it up, please, Linda? Because I must carry on with business while we're waiting for him. Can't sit here doing nothing all day. <laughs> Prince George. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. I don't know whether if you read in last week's paper there was a small clipping. What paper? <laughs> The Prince George is the citizen. No, I don't see the citizen. I should get it. There could have been a clipping about RCMP training cutbacks. And I was wondering um, why there would be cutbacks when the crime rate is growing and the cities are growing and they're trying to keep the training facilities down to a zero growth. I saw on the CTV National News, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, they've cut back considerably the number of uh, intake of recruits in Regina because of the federal cutback. I think the federal liberals are determined to convince us that they're going to cut back regardless. Big fuss last night about cutting back federal grants for bilingualism. The whole thing was a phony kind of a story. We had the same story in the RCMP. Uh, they're trying to impress on us as they come up for an election that they're going to cut back, and they'll probably cut back all the wrong things. You know what like the feds are. But I saw the story, I believe the story, uh, and, of course, they've wrecked the armed forces by all accounts. In fact, I meant to say something this week about that incredible speech by the Admiral, acting as a politician with Barney Danson sitting beside him, telling us we don't have an armed forces, the whole thing has fallen to bits and all the rest of it. They've cut back. The armed forces, of course, are a farce anyway, as we all kind of generally realize. But it's just part of the old Fed liberal propaganda to convince you that they're efficient and... Uh, cutting out the fat. They'll probably cut out the meat instead of the fat. But I saw the story, and uh, I'm glad you're watching the program. I hope you're enjoying it on occasions. Okay then, Jack. Much obliged. Bye-bye. How about the stats can chap? Pardon? There's no one at stats can who can tell me on the air about this program. So much for public relations of the federal government. I'm now going to move delicately around, tuck in my chair and sit down. Okay, back the phones. Hello? Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. Yes, yes. Regarding the two calls there about this phoning about, um, in the evening about crime. Yes. Um, I had a very articulate uh, phone call from a young man last week who said he was this an investigation to help crime prevention and for publication in, in Statistics Canada. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we're a good 20 minutes on the air uh, and all of the questions were relative to the area I was living in. Was there any crime here? Did I think I could walk out in the streets at night and so forth? Good questions. After he'd asked all of the questions, did we tell the people in the building around about to make sure the doors were locked at night and did we have a neighborhood patrol and what have you? After he had done all that, he said, um, now sir, this does not have to be pr printed or presented if you do not wish it to be. But if, since you've been cooperative in the uh, question that I've given you, um, you can say yes or no. Now, to me, I thought that was an excellent idea because what he was doing was, or what Statistics Canada apparently is doing, is trying to find out how to control crime and how to help the police do so. Well, I think it's a very good thing. I'd just like to get someone to explain it to everyone so that when we get the calls at night, we can be instantly fully cooperative. Oh, because he did say you, are, you have been picked out of 16,000, I think. Very good. You know, as long as they give you the number and say, if you wish to verify who I am, please call back this number, which you'll find in the phone book under so-and-so, and then you know you're speaking to the right office. Thank you very much, sir, for your information. Go ahead, please. Uh, Jack. Yes. This is in regards to UIC, uh, January the 7th. 
there's a cutback. Now, the statement you get with your check says that it's been reduced from 66 and two-thirds percent to 60 percent. Correct. That's six and two-thirds percent, right? Right. I phoned up the UIC, and the woman there informed me that it was 10 percent. So I got my check, and sure enough, it's 10 percent. Now, if they're getting three and a third percent extra from every claimant, they're going to be uh, making some good money, aren't they? It was decided in the legislation to go from 66 and two-thirds to 60. Right. But you were saying you only got 56 and two-thirds. 32 two instead of 147, so I only What did you get instead of what? Instead of 147, I got 132. That's $15 or 10%. Damn close to it. And they Maybe there was some other adjustment. I'll put that, put that down for Brian to have a look at that. Will you please we'll talk to some of these people? I, I must go for the moment because I'm going to finish off with a, a report which will be stale if I don't use it soon. All right, thank you, Jack. Thank you. It's an update on what's going on with the compulsory heroin treatment program. Well worth watching, I do assure you. Eight oh five West Broadway the other day. I looked up the eighth floor and I thought, I wonder how they're getting on. And it... I was just passing eight oh five West Broadway the other day. I looked up the eighth floor and I thought, I wonder how they're getting on in the Alcohol and Drug Commission. So I popped up to question the two top guys in the commission just to see what the score is, because as you know, I am a protagonist for the Heroin Treatment Act under the Health Plan. Bert Hoskins, Bert. Uh, Give me the bad news first. What's going wrong in your program? Well, nothing's going wrong. The thing is that because of the amendment to the Heroin Treatment Act, it created a, a number of problems for us. In the first instance, we had to review our procedures. Mm -hmm. We had to look at the kind of documentation that would be required. Those two things caused us, uh, as well as the um, change in, in the time certain of our facilities became available, in other words, the renovations weren't complete. I want to stop you there, though, yeah. because, you know, everybody was gung-ho, including yours truly, that would be all set to go on January the 1st, right? Well, we are set to go on January the 1st. All we're telling you is that we are doing it on a phased basis rather than all at once. What are all these phases? Just explain them to me. January the 1st, we have taken over all people currently under treatment from our own direct service units and from the funded agencies who formerly provided the service. How many is that? I would say in the neighborhood of 336. 336. They're the people who were in, the, in under treatment for one reason or another last year. That's right, under voluntary treatment in, in a number of agencies throughout the province. When will Brandon Lake be ready? We'll have Brandon Lake ready on the 1st of April. And but will, will you then have the power for, the, will the police then be requesting addicts to report to you under terms of the act by April the 1st? No, there are three phases. What's the second phase? The then? second phase is voluntary entry and entry through the court system. Phase three, which will come in in July, is entry through police notice or police referral. Phase two is what? Voluntary entry and entry through the courts. Voluntary entry, small entry entry, but how many voluntary entries have you had? Well, uh, I can't uh, give you a precise figure at the moment, but one thing that's very encouraging to us is people are becoming to, are coming forward now and saying to us, when will Brandon Lake be available? I'd like to come in for treatment in this facility in particular. I think one other problem that I should have mentioned was, and it's a very uh, encouraging sign, is that we were overwhelmed with a number of applications from people who wanted to work for us. And we have had over 1,500 applications. Maybe that merely reflects unemployment. No, it doesn't, because of the kind of people that we are getting offering their services. You mean people from other good jobs? People from other good jobs, people from all parts of Canada. And when you think that you have to process 1,500 people, uh, you have to assess each individual, you have to interview some people, and you have to s select a, a final person. How that many? in itself has caused some delay. How many have you actually hired so far? Uh, up to now, I would say 120. And your total staff is 300 and something? No, we have 252 regular positions authorized and 111 auxiliary positions. What about your area coordination centers? I have a feeling that you're hiring people whose work is not ready for them yet. Uh, we have, and that's another plus sign for us, I think five of the most appropriate people we could possibly hire as the directors of each one of these regional areas. Where are these regional areas? The regional areas are the Vancouver area. Vancouver. 
Victoria, mm -hmm. Nanaimo, mm -hmm. Prince George, mm -hmm. and Kelowna. And the Nanaimo area has a an outreach area in Campbell River because we have a special problem there. Will these area coordination centers have any holding facilities for recalcitrant people? Uh, well, uh, I wouldn't use the word recalcitrant, but uh, we do have uh, in each one of the area coordinating centers a small holding area to hold people overnight as part and parcel of the examination and the assessment. Procedure. John, John Russell. John, your title again, please, John, I forget. Deputy Commissioner? Commissioner with the alcohol. Oh, you are a commissioner. Yes. He's almost expected to wear a uniform as a commissioner. Eh? John, what do you say to the people who don't have my views, who say the whole thing's a waste of public money? Well, I think, first of all, we have to realize the extent of the problem in B.C. Our estimate is that there are at least 8,000 heroin users in the province. I think we have to realize that the incredible expenditure on law enforcement that is required to, to keep that number down to 8,000, which I think people often forget. And I think the other thing we have to look at is what heroin addiction means to the heroin well, user. First of all, I can cure your law enforcement problem in a flash, and the answer might well be just to legalize the heroin. And that wipes out the criminal element. We've done a very extensive analysis of the implications of legal heroin and looked in the situation in Britain in great detail, and it simply is not a solution. And as far as we can see, legalized heroin creates as many problems as it solves. Tell me, has the plan chased all or any of the addicts out of British Columbia? No. We have no information that addicts are leaving BC. We're in a fairly constant contact with the authorities in Alberta, and as yet there is no sign that they are turning up in Alberta. How will you, this is a key question, how will you handle, we keep calling them clients, should we call them patients? We call them patients. How will you handle patients that won't cooperate? I mean, short of, if I come into the program on a voluntary basis and walk away, you'll forget about it, will you? I think the first thing we have to realize is the majority of heroin users want to do something about their heroin addiction. And given the opportunity, and especially the opportunity we have to offer, uh, we expect that they will cooperate with the program. Now, Good. we're not so naive to think there aren't going to be some who are going to resist every possible effort. And our strategy will be, first of all, to have uh, various treatment options available, uh, to work with those individuals to help them overcome their narcotic dependence. In the final analysis, if somebody refuses all possible help that we can offer them, uh, we will have to say to that individual that obviously he's not going to respond to treatment and there's really nothing we can do. How many do chances will I get before you just say to me, go out and get picked up by the narcs? I think we would make every humanly possible effort to try to get you to control your narcotic dependency and try to get you to do something positive about your life. But is it not a classic behavior of a heroin addict? He only comes to you for that moment when he needs help. And then when he makes the score or shoplifts or does a little burglary, wham, he's got the heroin again. I think that's uh, certainly a phenomenon that's happened in the past. And one of the advantages we have with this program, because it, we are able to hold them in treatment for a significant period of time, is we can keep them in treatment long enough to do something uh, about their situation. The problem, the problem in the past has been that they come in when they really have the pressure on them and as soon as the pressure is off they leave and you can't really make any progress. The only place you can keep them in treatment is in Brandon Lake. No, I don't agree. We anticipate that the majority of people in this program will be treated in community clinics and the majority will cooperate with treatment in community clinics. You haven't got rose-colored glasses? No. Oh, Jeff, there's, yeah, there's something else I think we don't want to overlook because it's one of the most important aspects of the total program, and that is for the first time in the history of treatment, we have what we call an adequate aftercare capability. So we can do something for him in his leisure time. Matt, you're not a social worker. No. I, I hope you're not becoming one. Inadequate aftercare the capability to look after a person during his leisure time. We have never had that before. Okay, what do you mean? I don't understand. Right, the well, capability to look after him during his leisure time. You mean to have a one-on-one -on -one social worker? No, but we'll probably have them on a basis of 1 to 25 or 1 to 30, and that's unheard of. You mean that's date. good? That's excellent. One care worker for 25 to 30 patients. You see, what happens What's now... What's that got to do with his leisure time? everything to do with his leisure time because the last thing in the world the addict's capable of doing is, is doing something constructive during his leisure time, as you know as well as I do. If I come into the program, am I stuck for the full three years? Yep. Yes, if you're uh, found by the evaluation panel to be a narcotic user in need of treatment. If yeah. you are not a narcotic user, then you would be able to come in voluntarily and not subject to the legislation. 
If I'm which? If you're not a narcotic user. What am I, you, what am I coming to you for then if I'm not a narcotic you user? You might be a barbiturate user or a Valium user. Oh, I see what you mean. If I'm a narcotic user and come to you, I'm in for three years. That's great. Otherwise, I'm okay. Um, how do you prove narcotic dependency? We will do an extensive assessment, including your analysis, a medical assessment, a psychological testing, and background interview. We will have an evaluation panel made up of at least three people, two of which will be physicians, and it will essentially be their decision as to whether they feel the individual is in need of treatment for narcotic dependence. Are you down in the dumps about the program, John? Are you full of confidence as you were before? We're very confident that the program is going to be very successful. What about the constitutional test? Not at all. Uh, on the best legal advice we can get in terms of the Act itself and in terms of the British North America Act, we feel that uh, our Act is constitutionally sound. Best of luck. You'll need it. Yeah, we've done it. Hi, Larry. The alcohol and drug thing was hardly the lighter side, but at least it was a change. And I get fed up stuck behind this desk, you know. You feel like in a wee box. So Linda's going to have a visitor this morning, if I don't trip over all these cords. Walk gracefully, hold in stomach, head up, chin back. Smile. Good morning, Miss Datka. Good morning. How are you this morning? Fine. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Um, what are we going to have tomorrow? We have a visit from a Tory MP by the name of Dean Whiteway. Dean who? Whiteway. Whiteway, is that his yeah. real name? He's from Ed Fryer's old riding, Selkirk. Oh, maybe he'll be Governor Selkirk. General one day. Could be. We'll have to call him his full name. Edward Fryer. You can't see Ed Fryer anymore. That's lazy majesty. Right. One thing we're not going to have tomorrow morning is what? The judges. No more. Got it. Dead. Gone. Finished. Battle lost. Forget the whole thing. But not forgotten. What time are we on tomorrow? 9 a.m. precisely. Precisely? Yeah. 9 a.m. precisely? Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Right.